Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Henry and myself, George Dengas, the co-moderator of this session. Dr. Henry is a past president of the Society of Cardiac Angiography and Interventions. Great pleasure to have you with us uh, here, and of course, congratulations on bringing Sky to a totally different level during your presidency. Uh, we have a distinguished panel, uh, Dr. Mauricio Cohen, Dr. Prasad, Dr. Sandoval, Dr. So hopefully will join us soon. Dr. Seto and Dr. So Shank uh, will uh, be asking questions after each talk. And let's start with Dr. Baber. Dr. Usman Baber, my former colleague at the uh, Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and currently heading the Interventional Cardiology and Cardiac Cath Lab at the Oklahoma University Medical Center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. He's going to talk to us about how to approach the high bleeding risk patient. Certainly a very controversial subject. Great. Usman, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Dangas, Dr. Henry. Thank you for the opportunity. So over the next few minutes, um, I'll try to launch this session um, discussing how to approach the high bleeding risk patient with the focus on how we define these patients and some of the evolving antithrombotic strategies. So uh, first of all, we have a very important document published in 2019 that for the first time gives us a standardized taxonomy and that tells us exactly who is and who is not at high bleeding risk. And there are two key points from this paper. The first is that we have the criteria set forth uh, in front of us, and a lot of these are pretty intuitive. But secondly, as importantly, is that this document also gives us a threshold. So we deem patients at high bleeding risk, or HBR, if their annualized risk of major bleeding is at least 4%. Here are the criteria. There are major and there are minor. If you have at least one major or two minor, you are an individual at high bleeding risk. Multiple registries have validated these criteria. This is just one from the Mount Sinai group <clears throat> that shows the prevalence of high bleeding risk in patients undergoing PCI is very high, well over uh, two-thirds. And if you look at the right-hand panel, you can see out of the major criteria, anemia seems to be the most common. Out of the minor criteria, age over 75. So uh, we now have a definition. We know this is very common. The challenge before us is how do we treat these patients? And there are really three uh, sort of evolving uh, antithrombotic strategies that have been crystallized in the literature, and we'll kind of talk about each one of these in turn. The first is the one that has been applied most directly to the HBR patients, and that's simply doing as short a duration of DEPT as you can, and then transitioning to a single agent. Second is aspirin withdrawal with continuation of a P2Y12 inhibitor. And third is this concept of de-escalation. So let's start off with the very first one. Um, that is going to a very short duration of DAPT. And as I mentioned, this is the strategy that has been most aptly uh, really applied to the HPR patients. There are several non-randomized studies. This is one published by Dr. Moran and colleagues looking at HPR patients, average age of 75, 40% on an oral anticoagulant. And they were treated with either three months of DEPT on the left or one month of DEPT and then transition to aspirin alone. And these patients were then compared to historical controls in using propensity techniques, and in the top of this uh, um, a slide, you can see the results for the patients who got three months of DEPT. You can see on the far left, no differences in thrombotic events. In the middle panel, significant reductions in bleeding. So reassuring results, but these are non-randomized data, and to really move this field, we need randomized data. And for this, we have the recently published MASTER DEPT trial. I think the probably the most important trial in this space, it is the only one that has actually enrolled patients at HBR and then randomized them to do two different strategies. Um, uh, antiplatelet regimens. Again, average age 76, one-third with oral anticoagulant. Over one-third also presented with a troponin-positive ACS. All patients got four weeks of DAPT. They were then randomized in the green to just a single antiplatelet agent that was at the discretion of the treating physician, or in blue to a standard regimen of either an additional two or five months of DEPT based upon whether or not they were on an oral anticoagulant. The results on the top left show us with respect to ischemic events, the uh, Kaplan-Meier curves on top of one another, uh, meeting the criteria for non-inferiority. And on the right, you can see with respect to bleeding, a significant 3% reduction, primarily driven by bark type 2 bleeds. So very important data that finally gives us some reassurance and an evidence base if we want to treat these HBR patients with a very short duration of DEPT. We have it here based on this, this trial. 
And in our guidelines, um, they haven't quite incorporated these data that just got published. ACC and AHA guidelines in 2016 and the most recent iteration in 2021 give a 2B recommendation. After three months of DEPT, you can stop the P2Y12 inhibitor. ESC guidelines are a little bit more forthcoming. They say in high bleeding risk patients, it's a 2A to stop after three months. I think as more evidence um, accrues and evolves, these guidelines will probably undergo changes. So what about the second strategy, and this is the uh, concept of withdrawing aspirin and continuing a P2Y12 inhibitor, again, a complementary strategy to lower bleeding, but the application of this strategy has really not been in the quote-unquote true HBR patients, but really in those patients where we want to think about a strong P2Y12 inhibitor, and that's really going to be our ACS patients. The construct and the rationale is illustrated in the slide, and the idea really is that when you have a strong P2Y12 inhibitor on board and you add aspirin, you really don't get any additional platelet aggregation or I'm sorry, platelet inhibition. And um, the, the data uh, summarized in this table shows us uh, the various trials that have looked at aspirin withdrawal um, in the setting of ACS, uh, five total trials, either exclusively enrolling patients with ACS or in subgroup analyses. All of these trials compared a short duration of DEPT followed by a P2Y12 inhibitor versus a control arm of continuation of DEPT. If you look at the far right-hand panel of this, uh, of this table, again, the, H, the bleeding rates, the major bleeding rates are all less than 4%. And I put that there simply to remind us and emphasize that when we think about these different strategies, this has really not been tested in that master DAP type patient where an annualized rate of uh, major bleeding approaches 4%. So what do the um, uh, data tell us? Well, in pooled analyses, we know on the far left, it, certainly we would expect reductions in bleeding. We get large 50% on a relative scale reductions in bleeding. But more importantly, on the right, we see no signal of excess harm with respect to recurrent thrombosis, if anything, um, a trend towards, towards benefit. And so where have the guidelines come on this? Well, the ACC and HA guidelines in the most recent um, publication uh, in 2021 have now given a 2A recommendation for, for short duration of DAP and now stopping the aspirin and continuing a P2Y12 inhibitor. ESC similarly uh, has also come out with a 2A recommendation for this. It's important to note that guidelines do not tell us which P2Y12 inhibitor. Most of the data is with ticagrelor, some data with clopidogrel, whether I think there's some caution in the setting of ACS. No data thus far for prasugrel, but notwithstanding that, guidelines now uh, have adopted this strategy as 2A recommendations. And then finally, what about de-escalation? Now, the idea of de-escalation is that early after PCI or ACS, when thrombotic risk is highest, that's when we want our most intense platelet inhibition. But after several weeks to months, we know bleeding risk accrues and thrombotic risk is attenuated, and therefore we can perhaps, quote unquote, de-escalate in that transition. Uh, how do we do it? Well, um, you can either switch from a strong P2Y12 inhibitor to clopidogrel, or you can go from a higher dose to a lower dose of a potent P2Y12 inhibitor, so 10 to 5 of prasugrel, 90 to 60 for ticagrelor. This can be guided using genotype data or platelet function testing or unguided, and it can occur at the time of PCI or several weeks later. So one can quickly uh, imagine all the different permutations, and, and the clinical trial evidence uh, mirrors that as well. Here is one uh, uh, analysis published by one of our fellows looking at the data with respect to de-escalation. Again, in the setting of ACS, this is where we would think about applying the strategy because we're going to really think about de-escalation in those patients where we want to either use a strong P2Y12 inhibitor up front or continue DAP without the penalty of bleeding. So in this pooled analysis of about 11,000 patients on the left, you can see when you look at de-escalation compared with continuation of DAPT, large and significant reductions in bleeding, again, not surprising. Surprising, but what we want to pay close attention to is whether or not we're paying a penalty on the ischemic side, and the right-hand force plot shows the exact opposite, in fact, a significant reduction in ischemic events. So two different complementary strategies, withdrawal of aspirin and de-escalation, both with good, uh, good evidence, important to note. To date, we still don't have direct head-to-head -head comparisons of these strategies against one another, and I think that will continue to be an evolving piece of, of clinical science and investigation. Where do the guidelines come? Uh, with respect to de-escalation, the ESC guidelines did give this a 2B in, in their last version. Interestingly enough, the ACCAHA guidelines um, do not mention de-escalation as, as a potential strategy, with I, which I find as an um, perhaps um, interesting omission, and maybe that'll get changed as, again, more data accrues in the coming uh, months to years. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. Yeah, great. This is a great uh, uh, discussion. And if we have any any uh, any question from the uh, audience, please just uh, oh yes, we do. Go ahead. <laughs> 
Mike from a SVG graft uh, to PDA, where somebody in an outside hospital like seven months ago did a stent at anastomosis, and the patient uh, had some hematuria, so, <clears throat> sorry, he was on effient. So he asked the patient to stop the effient. Literally seven days after stopping effient and being on baby aspirin, he came to us with inferior cell elevation and my the SVG was full of clot, so I just did aspiration basically, and then a little bit of angioplasty. I didn't want to commit him to a new stent. There was underexpanded stent there. So really, I think there's, a, you know, we need to not forget the patient characteristic and the type of PCI, the number of stents, the layers, the locations, all that thing before deciding if we can go shorter. And I don't know if uh, you guys have any idea about. Yeah, the so patients who have been enrolled in the trials. Yeah, so I completely agree. We, we know uh, PCI complexity, however one wants to define that, uh, based on how many stents, bifurcation, or the lesion characteristics is certainly associated with more thrombotic risk. As far as clinical trials go, we don't have sort of randomized data comparing that. Now, Master DAPT, if you look at, I think the average stent length was about 40 millimeters. So they did have some complex patients in ACS, and they got away with just doing four weeks of DAPT. Um, other thing I think is in some of these patients with, you know, bleeding, if it's kind of minor, uh, it's probably safe to interrupt for a few days, stabilize that, and then put them back, you know, if it's going to be clopidogrel or lower dose, lower dose effian, rather than all of a sudden having to stop everything. Obviously, in certain patients with large bleeds, you do, but a lot of patients with these more minor bark type 2, I think that's not obligatory. Uh, Mauricio, what, what would you do in the, this case? With the bleeding after the SVG stand, would you have stopped the effient altogether or follow what uh, Usman says to maybe use Plavix afterwards or something else? Yeah, so that, that's a very, it's a, it's, a very, it's a very humbling case. I think we're all in a state of confusion with so many trials and so many permutations and so many agents that we can use now and also the insurance companies and the confusion of the patients. So it's, uh, it's very complicated. I would have done the same thing that uh, you did. I would have probably stopped... Uh, Probably I would have stopped aspirin and de-escalate uh, and de-escalate the F into uh, clopidogrel. I think it's too early, so I would have probably done a, a lower intensity based on no data, just on my my, my inner yeah. feeling. Great. Yeah, no data. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have to use our uh, knowledge of pathophysiology and all that to try to navigate. Let's move on to another very interesting aspect: the optimal pharmacology for the STEMI patient. Uh, Dr. Tim Henry, my co-moderator, will uh, uh, start up with this one. So, Usman, on just one comment about we, we have a lot of great randomized data now, but we've created chaos and in, in like how to do this and standardize it at your institution is difficult. And that, I think that's one of the key things with STEMI. So, is my talk there? Yeah, okay, so you missed my title, but that's okay, you knew that. So I have nothing to disclose related to this topic. It's really, it's a complex topic, and I have eight minutes. And I will say that everyone thinks this is kind of a finished issue, and there's a lot of things that we don't talk about, and we've so focused on the process of PCI that maybe we've forgotten the pharmacology, so we're going to do that. So what have we learned? We're so really important uh, for what Usman, and that's this issue about uh, antiplatelet and anticoagulant therapy. The goal is to prevent ischemia, but the b balancing part of that is it causes bleeding, and getting the right balance is critical. Number two, that balance changes over time. So in the first, and I'm going to show you, most of the ischemic events are in the first six hours. And that's critically important, whereas over time, so initially ischemic issues are more important. And then as you go on, bleeding issues become more important, thus uh, what you just heard from uh, uh, Usman. And more importantly, it's chaos because there's way too many antiplatelet agents. So what I want to do is go forward and say, listen, the clinical challenges with STEMI are this. There's delayed bioavailability. The morphine and fentanyl both showed to delay vas uh, uh, availability. Mechanical ventilation, vomiting, cardiogenic shock, and auto hospital cardiac arrest are even more complicated for oral agents. Sedation and hypothermia all affect your antiplatelet therapy. 
And in STEMI more than anything else, your antiplatelet and antithrombin therapy are critically important. So this is a little bit hard to see, um, but I think this is a standardized approach and let's talk about this. So number one, I passionately believe that for your STEMI network, you should have a standardized protocol. And in that includes uh, as early as possible, and this is what the guidelines say, as early as possible, you should give aspirin 325 milligrams, you should get IV heparin 4 to 5,000, make it standardized, you don't need an IV, you don't need a drip. You should do pretreatment. I'm going to talk about pretreatment, but the pretreatment should be with ticagular and prasugrel. By default, it ends up being ticagular because you don't have to worry about the black box warning. And then once you get to hospital, I'm not going to talk too much about this antithrombin. Most people are using heparin now. Now, but there is a big debate, the um, uh, bivalrudin versus heparin debate, mostly just because of availability, it's come to heparin. And then the use of Kangalore in uh, guidelines, say, in P2I12 uh, naive patients or high risk, we're going to talk about that. And then the issue about 2B3 inhibitors, there's been a downgrade significantly in both use and, and the problem is with excess bleeding. And then we're going to talk about what to do long term. So specific issues I'm going to try to be in and deal with. Number one, pretreatment. The advantage is you decrease periprocedure peri MI, you decrease early synth thrombosis and ischemic events. The disadvantage is, um, the concern is that uh, patients may need surgery, if then so you worry about bleeding, There's, uh, is there increased procedural bleeding risk? The answer is no. Um, and then if you have to do surgery, this delay. Well, what I'll tell you is the need for uh, bypass in STEMI is less than 1%. The need for bypass in non-STEMI is about on 10 to 15 percent. So it's an issue, and we wouldn't pretreat a non STEMI, but I passionately think we should pretreat in a STEMI. Now, what's about the data? The data is limited, and it's really the Atlantic trial, which was too fast, right? The treatment was less than 30 minutes in both groups. At, where there is strong data, our registry data, we have shown that if you transfer people from outside and you get them pretreatment, that they have a lower stent thrombosis than the patients who came to the PCI center. So there's a lot of suggestive data that pretreatment matters, and I'm going to show you why that's important because we're going to look at the onset of action. So if you look at this, the pharmacodynamics, um, number one, first of all, the events. This is from the Phoenix trial, but I could show you 10 trials that are the same thing. Almost all the ischemic events occur within the first six to 12 hours, and most in the first six. So that's the vulnerable side. That's when you need antiplatelet therapy. And we know for sure in STEMI that Plavix has delayed onset. We also know, look, this is Ticagrelor versus Prasugrel. It's a very good pharmacodynamic trial that shows at one hour you have almost no antiplatelet effect. And it takes six hours until you actually have. That's past the time. Well, that's why we have events, right? Because we're doing PCI in STEMI patients without any platelet effect. So that's why that's where all the events are. And then Kangalore is IVP to I12 inhibitor that is immediate onset and you do the delay and then it's a rapid offset. And so really, this is actually the best pharmacodynamics for what you need in STEMI patients. All right, this is the Cantic trial, which actually randomized uh, crushed ticagular versus cangular. And what you can see is, again, at two hours, it's a little hard to see, but at two hours, you're done with your PCI, patients upstairs, and there is excellent antiplatelet therapy with cangular, and it's not even close yet with crushed ticagular. So we're doing PCI in these patients without antiplatelet on board, and, and it does, it's not till four hours. So this is actually a nice paper that I'll send. What are our, um, um, to get to this in the issue with STEMI, how do we actually get past this? And the best way to do it is really with using IV um, P2I12 inhibition. Uh, and the crush is better than nothing. And in, this is actually in the Phoenix trial that shows that actually significantly you cut your stent thrombosis in half. After that, it makes far less a difference because you have adequate P12 inhibition on board. What about cardiogenic shock and cardiac arrest? These are the sickest patients, and the most important issue about this is there's no randomized data. Number two, cardiogenic shock and out hospital cardiac arrest, every trial shows that they have worse TIMI grade 3 flow at the end of the case than regular STEMI. 
Number three, they have, their challenges for oral antiplatelets are higher, and their bleeding risk with 2B3 inhibitors is higher. So this, in particular, is the strongest theoretical advantage for using Cangrelor. There's very limited data, but this is actually data from the SCAR registry, 889 patients. So this is a national Swedish registry of STEMI patients. 889 patients had Cangular versus 4,600 without. The different sites varied from 4 to 36 percent use of Cangular. Cangular was used in higher risk patients, left main, cardiac arrest, thrombus. The use in uh, auto hospital cardiac arrest was 19%, and stent thrombosis was actually a little bit lower, but there was no difference despite having markedly higher um, uh, high risk patients. So suggestive that this is benefit for with using Cangular in that patient population, no randomized data. What about post STEMI duration? So the guidelines would say 12 months, but everything you just talked about in terms of, of short dip, single dip, stop the aspirin, de-escalation, um, the data that we have, actually the best data comes from the TECO STEMI trial, which took about a, a 1,100 patients who were in STEMI. It was 36% of the patients in the trial. And they did randomized patients to DAP for three months and then stop the aspirin versus DAP for 12 months. So in what you saw in this, intention to treat and as treated, and so the as treated, there was significantly less bleeding, okay, in the stop the aspirin arm, and there was, um, this is major bleeding, you can see in particular a significant reduction, and then what you had is in, in terms of ischemic events, if anything, the trend was in the right direction. So it appears that what we saw in twilight is consistent with STEMI 2, but this is not in the guidelines yet, and this was not just STEMI patients, this is an analysis of the STEMI patients. And then finally, I'm going to finish with novel antiplatelet approaches. There's a couple drugs out there, this is actually RUC4, um, that are actually designed to give sub -Q and have an initial onset. This is actually, on. you can see, you have two to three hours of excellent antiplatelet action. This is really analogous to Reopro, um, and that's, those trials are being done. We're actually given pre-hospital sub-Q. So there are some new agents on the way. These are the current guidelines. A potent P2I12 inhibitor should be given immediately, as soon as possible. That's 1A, and I think Prasigrel and Ticagrel are preferred. Clopidogrel would be second choice. Aspirin is 1B. 2B3 inhibitors is 2A if you need bailout. And then finally, Kingalor in the right patients. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Tim. This was a tremendous overview, a very complex uh, subject, I must say, with many uh, possibilities. Any, any uh, comment from the uh, audience, please come this way. There is a microphone uh, somewhere. Yes, go ahead. And, we're going to have also some comments from the panel, but uh, definitely a, a very rich uh, yeah, thank, thank subject. Thank you for, for both of you. Great talks. Do you mind uh, commenting if there's no kangaroo, not on formulary, and you have a STEMI that's not been pretreated? Do you mind commenting on, on like a bolus of 2B3A without a drip until you get over these two hours? So there's lots of ways to get through it, and clearly that's an option that people do. Now, I will say personally, in your, in your STEMI network, this should be done ahead of time and planned out. So I passionately believe that there should never be a patient who comes to your lab that's had not already been pretreated. And so because of it, but there's definitely the use of like say a short bolus, it hasn't been tested really in a consistent manner. It's one option to get in that vulnerable period for sure. I think the uh, issue with 2B3, this is my own bias, is that there's more bleeding, and so I tend to would use Kangler in that, but if you can pre-treat soon enough, especially people transferred from a non-PCI center, you can have adequate P2I12 on board by the time they get to you. Tim, I have a question. So if you're gonna do your STEMI radially, yep. uh, does that give you a little more confidence in using a 2B3A if you wanted to? Yeah, I think certainly you can, but remember if in 2B3 in here is 50% of the bleeding is non-access site. So the answer is a little yes, and um, um, so, but overall usage of 2B3 in here has gone down, and it's just really because of the bleeding. <laughs>
Yeah, but in general, if you don't have kangaroo formulary, which is the, your yeah. question, then you absolutely need to have some like that available in for immediate use. Uh, no question about that. Yes, in you, my mind. For high thrombotic, for the cardiogenic shock and cardiac arrest, you clearly need to have a strategy to have adequate antiplatelet on board. Yeah, Arnold. Yeah, I just want to comment on this talk and the prior talk. I mean, we have so many options for antiplatelet uh, duration and type at this point, both in stable angina and for uh, STEMI or ACS, that it really behooves us as operators to really write detailed concluding notes and recommendations at the end of our procedure. No one else knows how many stents we put in, how long it was, what we think of as their thrombotic risk. So we should make an assessment of their bleeding risk and thrombotic risk and come up with something up front so that the referring doctors, the follow-up primary care doctors always know what is our plan, at least at that moment, yeah. for the for the antiplatelet uh, plan? So this is so important, and I so much believe in standardization. So everybody in our lab comes in with aspirin, heparin, and ticagular, and we know it. But what's happened when you leave the lab, and then what happens over a year, because of this chaos out there, it's been really challenging to have a standardized approach. And it, and it increases the number of phone calls from primary care and from other cardiologists, like, tremendously. I don't know how to solve that right now. Well, isn't the, maybe the idea should be to individualize for each patient's risk and individual thrombotic and, and bleeding risk, right? And so no one else has that authority except for you as the operator, and I think that it behooves us to, to be clear on what we want at the time of the procedure. Yeah, it is. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Tim. Now I get to uh, introduce George, and George is going to bring up the same thing. Do we still need aspirin post-PCI? Yeah, it's always a good question. Let's see how it's going and how we can sparkle up a, a, uh, some interest in the uh, subject of aspirin, which means to be a little bit of a historic medication. Well, as I thought to start from history and indicate that the idea of antiplatelet therapy has been from the very beginning intimately related with the type of PCI, the very first PCI. And indeed, what happened was that the aspects of reclosure and needing to fight in the platelets and all that became upfront. It was a very, very uh, a clear task and a goal. And aspirin was chosen as perhaps the simple, obvious choice in the absence of anything else, and clearly became, I would say, um, related with, the, um, with PCI from the very beginning, PTCA, I should say. There was even a randomized study uh, a little later that, in the, that aspirin beat Coumadin and, uh, in the f after PTCA, and that again gave, a, I would say, a small randomized study, of course, but gave them a, a push into the utilization. And at the same time, you can see the primary prevention um, in, uh, in, uh, in women, um, in, the, uh, uh, in the women's heart study became available, uh, I would say the nurse's heart study became available, and uh, you know, all of a sudden, aspirin was extended uh, to a lo lifelong prevention therapy. Anyhow, it became much more popular in all aspects of cardiovascular disease. Uh, at the same time, let's see where we were. Obviously, in the beginning, we were hyped up about uh, the thrombus and how do we prevent thrombus, this era of thrombosis, how to perfect it, dual antiplatelet therapy, all the other aspects we heard about. Then the last 10 years, we've come to an understanding that the bleeding is also an important aspect, particularly because the antithrombotic and antiplatelet regimens were getting longer and longer. So all of a sudden, the bleeding aspects emerged, particularly because of this long follow-up and the long exposure to these agents. And ultimately, we're trying to struggle with how to figure out an equipoise, how to figure out a balance, how to figure out this chaos, as everybody uh, uh, said before me. And I must say that the chaos exists in the clinical trials, perhaps, but it shouldn't exist within your own system, in your own hospital system, your own institution, if you come together and figure out what would be your way among all those and present that clearly in the concept of the cardiology ground rounds and make the relevant policies into the ER and all that, that would essentially indicate making a choice, your choice, perhaps not my choice, but clearly you can make things um, uh, sane within your own environment, same way we have a choice uh, at Mount Sinai Health System, you can have yours in your health system and so forth, and everyone might be, uh, I would say, somewhat mitigated. 
And the aspirin-free strategies of the, of the PCI came out and stemmed from the idea that could it be that a lot of the bleeding aspects were actually coming from the aspirin and not so much from all the other more expensive, I would say, still medications, but also aspirin, a lot of shortcomings regarding the GI uh, upset and other aspects of bleeding. And um, uh, at the same time, we knew that in the aspirin withdrawal did not really mean a lot as far as prothrombosis. That's another important aspect you need to think when you're taking these drugs away, perhaps something gets unmasked and all that. That did not seem to be the case based on uh, uh, experimental studies. That's not a good thing. Uh, stopping the aspirin because of the relatively long half-life, this happens like gradually, and not a lot of things happen like immediately. Uh, this is similar, the same slide that uh, Tim showed, but I just, uh, instead of left, right, or right, left, I made that uh, from top down, so it looks like a little bit of a different one, but essentially shows that the platelet activation is multifactorial, and perhaps the more important is the ADP activation that has a lot to do with the uh, disruption uh, and whatever happens during the PDCA and the cardiovascular disease, whereas uh, other aspects may be affecting more hemostatic abilities uh, in uh, places perhaps of trauma or cutting and all that, the skin and all that. Uh, so initially, uh, initial aspects of corpidogrel monotherapy were indicated, you can see here, in stop up 2 and the smart choice, and indeed seem to mitigate the bleeding without uh, impacting tremendously, or if at all, the MACE, the thrombotic endpoints. And again, this uh, will require to have a little bit more uh, encouraged in, in other studies, and such as those was clearly the twilight that had a remarkable run of positive results with a reduction in bleeding by nearly half and uh, without any MACE penalty. And let's go through one by one, and uh, the study of Dr. Baber first authored here in the pharmacodynamic study that indicates by withdrawing the aspirin, the uh, this small group of patients who were randomly assigned to placebo versus aspirin while on tacagrelor, they didn't seem to have any difference in the thrombotic potential as measured by various risk factors, by various, I would say, soluble factors, which I don't show here, but I show here the experimental thrombus area in the ex vivo model. So all the results indicated that not much activity really uh, in uh, supporting more thrombogenic activity, pretty much like the pre the in vitro model I showed you earlier, that the withdrawal of aspirin did not really exacerbate the thrombosis. So well, that's good news. That may actually justify why there would be not much difference in MACE. That's a good mechanistic endpoint. Then we did a further analysis on focusing just on the complex patients of twilight and see if that holds. Or is it that the complex patients, the left mains, the bifurcation, the long lesions, you can see on the left side the categories, all of those, could those people have the MACE, but because it was just a subgroup, this was kind of lost? Turns out that this wasn't the case. The, 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 this was still the same idea of cutting down a lot of bleeding, but didn't pay a penalty, even in the complex lesion subset. I think that was a very, very important analysis for our interventional colleagues, because because that's where really the question comes to. You have a simple lesion and you want to interrupt some drug, I think that might be an easy answer for any of us. But you have a complex lesion when you interrupt the drug, that might be a tougher question to answer. So I think that's why this analysis, although a subgroup, cuts to the core of our thought about this concept. And then we had an independent verification of this concept by the TICO trial from uh, South Korea, and uh, Tim presented the STEMI subset. Over all the results you can see here, very, very uh, rewarding that uh, the bleeding savings, particularly, again, in the length of time, again, indicating that the bleeding is more of a risk over time passing, and that's exactly what this curve see. They, they, they continue to separate as the time goes on. And the individual patient data meta-analysis essentially showed the same thing, uh, as led by Dr. Valji Migli. And uh, you can see that uh, no difference in the MACE on the left side, on the right side, a lot of reduction in the important bleeding, particularly in length of time. So uh, my take-home messaging were exactly on time. The patients of uh, 
CADS, CSPCI in general, aspirin is a good thing by the guidelines. Absolutely, nobody disputing that. But at the same time, the PDY12 monotherapy after a short initial course of dual antiplatelet therapy after PCI becomes a novel strategy for reduction of bleeding. And we can see that the most way in different angles from different places in the world and different kinds of complex lesion, it holds up as a valid and safe strategy. Thanks for your attention. All right, so that really excellent, George, and yeah, we are uh, right on time. And so let's do uh, something different after this one. I want to ask you first, and then we're going to start in the panel, that side coming this way. Uh, what Three questions. Do you actually, what percentage of your patients do you stop the aspirin at three months? And, and um, put, tell me the percent in ACS and the, in a non-ACS. Number two. What do you do at one year? Because Twilight went to one year. So at one year, do you restart the aspirin and stop the ticagular? Do you keep with the ticagular? I mean, you tell me yeah. that. And then number two, three, do you have an institutional policy? Yeah, the overall policy is to consider it uh, as one of several options that we consider. There's a little, a little bit of a drop-down menu that now includes this option as part of all the other options. So in the end of the procedure, the interventionalist makes a judgment on base of the knowledge of the patient and the, and the, and the lesion treated, what, uh, which one of the uh, three or four options to uh, configure. Um, I, I typically like to recommend the minimum positive and the minimum possible. And I personally reevaluate the patient at three months if we are to stop at the time in order to see how they do and all that. That's another a subject that I think we're uh, a little bit overachieving. That's why there's a little bit of chaos. Uh, everybody seems to want to make this decision of time zero or post PCI for like a whole year, if not for the patient's entire life. We kind of tend to miss a little bit that repeated visits and reevaluation are very common in cardiology, and the, I advise they should be employed. So this means that I want to consider stopping at three months. Well, why do I have to decide it right now? I can decide it easily at three months and feel a little bit better about it. Quite frankly, a little bit more, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more. Um, uh, secure about it. So I would say about a third of the patients falls into this category right now. And, uh, um, I, and at one year, I tend to use the Takaglor 60 milligram dose from then on. And uh, no, I don't feel the need to swap back and forth. I think that's very confusing. If the patient is doing well on a certain medication, I tell to go with the flow and continue that. All right. So panel, let's start at the far end and come back. Uh, this is Dr. Coley. I'm a non-invasive cardiologist, so I'm going to provide the perspective of uh, a generalist. And essentially what I do is I do about 6 to 12 months, unless there's a compelling reason to stop earlier, of dual antiplatelet therapy. I think, as you mentioned, the Pegasus data of using a lower-dose ticagrelor, we are not seeing that here in the community in Colorado where I practice nearly as much. But I think there is some evidence that prolonged, you know, at least single antiplatelet therapy could offer some benefit at a lower dose. My biggest concern as a non-invasive is when I see a patient five, six, seven years post-PCI, they're on their single antiplatelet agent and they're on oral anticoagulation. And that's when I think the clinical equipoise really comes in. Do you still need that single antiplatelet agent several years post-PCI? Can you get rid of it? The European guidelines tell us we can, but here in the United States, we don't really have a consensus. No, I stop it. You stop it. The aspirin. That's a consensus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I tend to take a, an approach similar to what George articulated, which is um, to kind of reassess and look for excuses or reasons to stop or to continue if the patient's doing well. In terms of institutional policy, we have those. And to Arnold's point about putting in place at the beginning, we try to dictate for a given case, how long we would want to um, do dual line platelet therapy and then, and then stop when, when situations arise. Uh, yeah, we individualize all of our patients because we can't get you know, protocols, consensus on protocols. So um, I think that's probably the future in terms of individualized therapies. It's going to be hard to get consensus. Uh, in terms of our strategy, we typically de-escalate. So go to Ticagrelor first for the first month and then de-escalate to Plavix for six months and then go to aspirin alone. So we are not dropping aspirin yet, uh, but you know, certainly there's that option. 
So I, I do basically what George said. We, you know, 30 days, three months, six months, evaluate, look at their cardiometabolic risk, uh, you know, is their diabetes controlled, et cetera, and uh, what, what I did to them, right? How many stents do you put in? How often do they come to the cath lab? Uh, all those factors. So I think it's very individualized. I've been getting rid of aspirin more frequently and using the P2Y12 as a monotherapy. So we individualize as well, but I think that all this data is reassuring. Many times you're forced to stop the antiplatelets because the patients are bleeding or the patients need surgery. So I think that these data are reassuring. Uh, surgeons have very little tolerance to p 2 12 inhibitors. Uh, we don't have a policy, and what do I do at one year? Um, I usually, I usually keep them, uh, I usually keep them aspirin, uh, not because of of the data. Yeah. So let's uh, go ahead. George, um, you know, in, in, the, um, in the stable uh, coronary disease area, there's not much room for any other thing than clopidogrel and aspirin, right? So why would be your, do you think it's reasonable to sort of replicate the same thing in after three months than just clopidogrel monotherapy? Or, uh, so that's my first question, and do you think the data uh, with ticagalor should generalize to other, uh, you know, uh, P2Y12 outside the stable coronary syndromes? Yeah, uh, well, the clopidogrel, about 40% of the people are going to be non-responders, or 30 to 40. So I think that's a, a little bit more of a difficult question to say regarding stopping the aspirin and leaving an agent that has a 30% non-responsiveness, I would be a little uncomfortable. No, the second part of your question, the, um, the, um, uh, the, whether we can use, whatever we said about Takagru, we can use about Prasugril, I think probably we can. So we just said, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So I was looking at the rest of the schedule. There's no talk on what to do with uh, dual antiplatelet therapy with people on anticoagulation. So I'm going to ask that question. Are you stopping aspirin even earlier? One week, two weeks? I mean, there's a lot of discussions about this on mm. dropping aspirin altogether. Uh, thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, practically everybody gets a couple of a few days of aspirin where in the hospital or whatever. So nobody can say those things. So it doesn't matter if you stop. But in general, I keep the patients of, or the combination of uh, uh, rivaroxaban 15 and clopidogrel or uh, Eliquis 5BID and clopidogrel after a few days. Or if uh, there's, someone is on Coumadin, that's another story. You have to really make sure that Coumadin is therapeutic, so they're going to have to take aspirin for a little longer until the INR is therapeutic. That's uh, something we got to uh, worry about. A another aspect is that in my practice, I, in these situations, I check the, the responsiveness. So I know patients are responsive to clopidogrel, and that's a good thing. I feel good about it. To make it simple for our nurse practitioners, we did standardize that, our interventional group meant. We go triple therapy for one week, and then we stop the aspirin. I, it's not that it's right or wrong, but at least we all do it the same, and so they know it. George, we have t two minutes left. I want to ask you a couple quick questions. What if there was a better aspirin that caused less GI bleeding? And then number two, what do you do with, uh, so the ticagular patient that has dyspnea or it's too expensive or doesn't want to take it twice a day and it's two months out? Yeah, well, the second, uh, let me talk to the second question, which is very simple. You just swap to clopidogrel and everybody's happy. The, uh, the you know, you can use a prasugrel if you want, that's fine. But are you uh, whichever it. alone without aspirin? Well, as you said, within a couple of months, so the patient is still on aspirin. Yeah, yeah, we're still on aspirin. We're not going to change everything all at once. If the patient has a problem with Takagrel, we're going to maintain on something, yeah. The, um, now, the, the other aspect uh, with your question there was better the, the better aspirin. Well, of course, it's a better aspirin, then, of course, then all bets are off. You have to show that there is a decreased bleeding, increased GI bleeding, and then, of course, you may uh, start to be using uh, uh, do some studies about that, no question about it. And I know there are some formulations out there that are claiming that, and uh, we, have to, we have to see about that. They, they, that may become another form of de-escalation or another form of uh, monotherapy. Uh, 
All right, so that's, that brings us to the next talk. Thank you very much, George, that was outstanding. So uh, our next talk, Tom is gonna talk us about allergic reactions in the cath lab and beyond. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Manos, thank you for bringing this amazing conference to Denver every year, we appreciate it. Um, I wasn't very happy with the topic that you gave me, to be honest with you, but uh, the truth be told, uh, I think all of us up here and all, all of you out there remember these, uh, these cases, and so this, a lot of emotional memory thinking about these uh, allergic reactions in the cath lab, so. Thank you, Manos. I have nothing to disclose. So I'll stay, start with the case. This was when I was a fellow at University of Michigan, and we had this 63-year-old woman with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. She was a prior smoker, and she was admitted for progressive exertional angina over six months. She had a normal echo. Her EKG was unremarkable. Labs looked fine, and given her classic anginal symptoms, she was brought to the cath lab for coronary angiography. Um, we did go radio back then even. Um, uh, there was no significant CAD and, you know, the patient, uh, I think a lot of you recall this, just became very anxious and agitated for no reason. Uh, she was given just a little bit of sedation. She was nauseous. And then as a, as a fellow, I was just uh, shocked to see how hypotensive and bradycardic she was and, and, and she looked like she was trying to die for sure uh, on the table. Um, and uh, I remember that still to this day, the look on her face of panic. And so that just brings us to the most obvious elephant in the room, which is the iodinated contrast agents. And um, this reaction uh, occurs in up to 1% of patients. And again, I think all of us have had cases like this, and our response to this could be potentially life-saving, or these patients can die in the cath lab or, or afterwards. Uh, but the, thankfully, the majority of these are mild or self-limiting. Um, back in the day, Eric Bates was my attending at the University of Michigan. He liked to use high osmolar ionic contrast agents still. I'm, I'm sure many of you don't even remember that. But every patient would have a reaction to that. With the V-Gram, they, uh, they would get diaphoretic, they would get nauseous, and they really didn't enjoy that. So that's one of the reactions. And the problem is that these symptoms uh, can be right away, uh, but they can often be delayed uh, even up to an hour. And so um, I think the more difficult cases are the ones that are obviously less obvious. Uh, but typically, the shorter the interval between the exposure and reaction, the more severe the reactions typically are. Now, the physiologic, when I was a fellow reaction to high osmolar contrast, is a chemotoxicity, osmotoxicity type of, uh, of effect. And that just has to do with the contrast agent. These patients typically get warm, they feel flush, they get uh, chills, they get nausea and vomiting. Um, just like when you do uh, a pelvic angiogram now, you can kind of warn them of that. Uh, they can get hypertension, chest pain, pulmonary edema. They can even have arrhythmia seizures, and, and they commonly will have a vasovagal reaction, uh, mostly sort of a basal gerish hypotension and bradycardia. The allergic reaction, I think, it's very familiar to any parent who has a kid with an allergy, peanut allergy, shellfish allergy. I have kids who have both. Um, and these are typically the urticaria, pruritus. Uh, you know when your kid's coughing, they can't clear their throat. That's a sort of bronchospastic, or uh, the rhinorrhea, uh, difficulty speaking, um, and chest tightness that they can get. Those are allergic. Um, and again, these are idiosyncratic, and we're not going to talk about anaphylactoid versus anaphylaxis. It, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but this sort of is a mass uh, mediated response that could be deadly. So in the cath lab, you know, these are the steps of evaluation because diagnosing the condition, again, can be a matter of life and death for your patient. Is the patient responsive? Um, if the patient is awake, you can ask questions. Do they feel itchy? Are they feeling congested? Are they having any nausea? And then uh, verbalization is key too. You know, patients who have laryngeal edema or throat swelling oftentimes have hoarseness in their voice. The vital signs are obvious uh, if they're hypotensive, bradycardic. Um, skin examination is key. Uh, there was a case recently in Denver of a patient who went on um, circulatory support for uh, dramatic vasoplegia in the cath lab, and they didn't realize this was really an allergic response until the patient went to the ICU 
and they completely uncovered the patient, and the patient was, um, had angioedema, urticaria of the legs, and redness. And so you really need to examine more than the skin and the face uh, if you're worried about an allergic reaction. A chest auscultation is better than just uh, listening, and the, the severity is really how you respond. You know, what are you going to do about these symptoms? Do you pull out um, epinephrine, yes or no, and, and do you give steroids and things like that? In physiologic responses, oftentimes the treatment is for whatever the sign or symptom is. So, for example, transient flushing or bradycardia, that usually uh, resolves on its own. Um, same with uh, the other things like mild hypertension, self-limiting. Um, if patients do have hypotension, then typically the treatment for that is to give pressors um, if needed, and of course to treat the arrhythmias and things like that. The allergic reactions you need to be a little more fastidious about, and, and of course the limited reactions that we more commonly see are things like pruritus, or they have some mild urticaria on their neck that uh, resolves. Uh, they can have some symptoms as well as nasal congestion. Uh, but the moderate to severe allergic re uh, response is what we really need to be careful about. And those are where you have widespread pruritus or edema, um, as well as urticaria. And it is thought that the worsening it is, the more it spreads, the more body parts that it involves, the more severe this could become. Facial edema, of course, with or without strider, hypoxia. Um, all of these moderate to severe allergic responses dictate more aggressive therapy. So I always tell, you know, when uh, I would tell the fellows to, to not overthink this, and I would tell the staff in the cath lab not to overthink this as well. And in general, though, if there are two organ systems involved, so if patients have both bronchospastic uh, symptoms and they have skin findings, that is uh, by definition moderate to severe and those patients need to be treated aggressively. The longer you wait to treat that, the more likely it is uh, to become severe and to be hemodynamically unstable, uh, which can lead to cardiac arrest, and that's what you want to avoid in the cath lab. Of course, when we're in the cath lab and we're doing procedures on patients, if this is a delayed response, you know, 20, 30 minutes, 45 minutes into the case with a PCI, let's say, of high risk, you have to figure out if there's an alternative diagnosis. And that is where we get distracted as we only think about mechanical or procedure-related complications and we don't and forget to think about a contrast reaction. Those patients are the ones that sometimes um, succumb to a cardiac arrest and then in retrospect, uh, the, the idea of could this have been a contrast reaction comes up. If that is, you've ruled out the, the alternative diagnosis, no effusion, the vessels are still open, um, obviously, you, you do ACLS if the patient has arrested. Um, but epinephrine um, is the key to reversing this process because it does interrupt the pathway of anaphylaxis. Um, and so um, there is no contraindication to epinephrine in anaphylaxis. You also have to deal with the airway. So if patients have angioedema, you may need to intubate the patient and also a large volume resuscitation. And the communication of the cath lab, this goes to the nurses, the techs, everyone involved that the dose of epinephrine that you give needs to be exact. And so this is typically, for me, the way I remember is I, I typically will give 50 mics of, of fennel um, for patients who have some you know, hypotension or they're a little dehydrated and you want to give them fluids. It's the same dose. So if you give 50 to 100 mics of epinephrine, that is the dose intravenously for your patient who you're worried about anaphylaxis. And if you give 50 to 100 mics, you're not going to get in trouble, if you give a milligram, as you know, a milligram could you know, put that blood pressure 220, heart rate of 190, and your 85-year-old patient may not tolerate that. So being exact about the dose is key. Um, I only write there that that's 0.5 to 1 cc of epi drawn up in the 0.1 milligram per ml, just because um, it, it could be in a different concentration in your code cart, and so you need to know exactly what you're mixing there. The adjunctive treatment to this is, you know, large volume resuscitation, also bronchodilators, but remember, that's not going to treat the mucosal edema and angial edema that could close your airway. Um, H1 blockers, uh, diphenhydramine for symptoms of urticaria itching, uh, vasovagal atropine is, is key for that. And then, of course, the threshold to give glucocorticoids when your patient's dying is very low. And if you have moderate symptoms or signs giving uh, glucocorticoids, the risk of that is also very low, as is 50 or 100 mics of epinephrine. So the threshold, if you're suspecting this, again, should be pretty low. There's, 
Um, some data to support that glucagon um, might be needed for patients who are on high-dose beta blockers. If you're given epinephrine, oh, the other thing, too, is make sure you circulate it and you're not having a response from your patient and they're on high-dose beta blockers. It could be uh, that you need to give glucagon uh, to counteract that effect. So examination of this uh, patient revealed uh, erythema and urticaria on the legs. We gave the patient 50 and then 100 mics of epinephrine, and uh, we circulated that. And she did require an epinephrine drip coming out of the cath lab. Uh, she maintained her blood pressure on this dose and was given hydrocortisone, antihistamines, and H2 blockers. It took a full 24 hours in the ICU uh, for her to be able to wean off her epinephrine. And you'll hear stories about this all the time, about rebound um, anaphylaxis. So, so it's not uncommon uh, that these patients will need uh, pressors going into the, into the ICU. And of course, her contrast reaction was uh, described and documented in her records and the need for prophylaxis for future contrast administration. Local anesthetics is, is, is another type of uh, uh, allergic reaction. Most of the time, this is considered contact dermatitis uh, with delayed swelling at the site, usually within hours and peaks at 72 hours. This is where the clinic gets called about a radial axis site with some uh, skin findings. General anaphylaxis or urticaria to anaf uh, local anesthetics is extremely rare. Uh, with case reports, and so it generally is not something that you see. I've never seen an anaphylactic reaction to local anesthetics. And a lot of times it's just that the, the administration of that was intravascular. Patients can get tachycardic, palpitations, they can feel poorly. Other times it's the other additives in your local anesthetic, like um, the EDTA or parabens. Also, it could be latex allergy or chlorhexidine, so those are other considerations. This is just a complicated pathway and up to date. The bottom line is um, that if you have a concern about contact dermatitis, um, then you just use an alternative agent. Um, same as if you think this is an allergic reaction, you also use an alternative agent. I can tell you that the whole estered amide class of local anesthetics and changing classes has been thoroughly debunked as legitimate, and so just using a different local anesthetic uh, is sufficient. Lastly, pro protamine hypersensitivity. We don't use protamine a lot, uh, interventional cardiologists. I think our surgeons do. Um, but having used some recently and reminding myself of, of, of how you give it, you just have to give it really slowly. Um, and then you want to cater the dose to not only how much heparin you gave, but uh, what the current ACT is. And you can get uh, protamine hypersensitivity reactions as well which sometimes you need to treat like anaphylaxis, um, but also there's supportive management as well. So my take home points really uh, today is for contrast reactions. In your career, a patient will try to die on you uh, because of a contrast reaction. And your recognition of an allergic like contrast rea reaction involving two or more organ systems and the administration of epinephrine will save a life, no question about it. And the lack of recognition um, these patients will die. Um, and watch out for the rebound reaction and be uh, cognizant of these patients needing ICU monitoring and maybe prolonged um, uh, presser agents. Local anesthetics, you know, a true allergic reaction is very, very rare. Um, you can send them to allergy for official testing, but in general, if you have an urgent procedure, just use a different anesthetic. Doesn't really matter if it's an amide or an ester. And then for protamine, just understand the risk factors and give a test dose. 10 milligrams over five to 10 minutes, and then administer after that test dose that you've proven they haven't had a reaction. You could treat with vasodilators, uh, I'm sorry, vasopressors, and if they do have anaphylaxis, which is where you treat it like anaphylaxis. Thank you. Uh, this is a great uh, talk about something that is not uh, discussed very uh, uh, many times. I have a question, let's say, that someone is allergic to the contrast. And typically they have to pre-medicate the day before and all that, and they forgot. Is there anything we can do on the day of the procedure short of sending the patient home and rescheduling? Yeah, so that, that I think has come up for, for all of us. Uh, I think there is registry data uh, that supports that 13, seven, one hour pre-medication regimen um, it does lead to a, a decreased incidence of severe allergic reactions. And so for, you know, at least in our practice, if patients um, are completely elective, we reschedule them. Uh, of course, if there's an urgent need, there are five, three, and one hour protocols of uh, 
uh, IV um, uh, steroids as well as H, H1, H2 blockers, that is also um, something that you can give. So if there's clinical urgency, we'll still just give the steroids and the H1 blocker right before the procedure, um, and that seems to, to work out okay as well. We do uh, 200 hydrocortisone maybe one to two hours before, and Benadryl never had a problem with that. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do the same, but the thing is that you have to establish what type of uh, allergic reaction the patient had before, because yes. there are allergic and allergic reactions, and then there's a myth of, I mean, I wanna, of, um, of um, fish, uh, shellfish allergy that has nothing to do with this, and it's just a myth. So, but everybody in the cath lab gets agitated when there's a shellfish allergy. You know, I think one of the keys that I didn't talk too much about is the documentation after a, a reaction is, is extremely important, uh, as Dr. Cito talked about, just the documentation. You know, if a patient has a reaction to the cath lab or in the radiology suite, you need to document exactly what that was so that, like Dr. Cohen, you can assess those symptoms and say, gosh, that's allergic reaction versus, you know, a nauseous sort of osmotic reaction, and that's key too. I yeah, think I just had uh, two comments, exactly what Mauricio said. Um, shellfish allergic, like people make the, there's iodine and shellfish and there's iodine and contrast, so therefore it's, it, it's, it's, it's total BS. So, and I remember like a, 20 years ago as a fellow arguing and a radiologist not wanting to do a, an exam for this, but I think now people have moved away and I think it's accepted that it's, it should never be considered any cross reaction. The second thing I wanted to mention is protamine. Um, you know, although specific allergy to salmon is rare, if you're allergic to salmon, you may have a cross uh, allergy. And the other thing also is you, you should ask your patient before giving protamine. It's not that rare that we give protamine, especially in the CTO world, when we've made a little holes and we want to stop it, we want to give protamine early, is to ask your male patient if they've had a vasectomy. Mm. Because there's a this cross reaction, those spermatozoids are dying in in the canals, basically, sort of cross react with the protamine, or I don't know exactly what's the mechanism, but they can have actually a strong reaction to protamine and get allergies. So maybe very weird as as a question, but to male patient now before I give protamine, I ask if they've had a recent vasectomy. And that's sort of embedded into my questionnaire as much as the, 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 the you know, the salmon allergy the as well. protamine is made from salmon sperm. So that's how they make protamine. Yeah, yeah. It's that's from it. salmon sperm itself. So you can get, if you've had a vasectomy, you get antibodies. And then there that's you go. the cross-reactivity. Re how, how does that uh, change your, um, the way that you administer protamine in these CTO perks? Like, how did what would you do I'm, just, I'm just asking the question. I haven't faced any patient yet who would say, yeah, I just yeah. had a reason. But I'm just trying to make sure that I'm cognitive to it before I give protamine. Yeah. I just ask these two questions quickly. And if I get like, because sometimes you're like, you want to give the protamine, but it's not like a life-threatening condition. But if I would have something that would mean, I could slow me in may, maybe administering it if I get this additional information. Let's put it this way. The other drug is so, NPH insulin. So NPH insulin, if they're on it, be very careful with uh, protamine. All right, we're going to stay on time. Thank you very much, Dom. And uh, I will be, just give one little antidote. There is an allergic reaction to contrast that ha does not have pruritus or, or hives. It's very rare. And I had one case, uh, in inferior stimuli, circ uh, lesion, great result. Um, patient just became hypotensive. And uh, LV gram, EF 60%, no mitre regurgitation, no hives, no shortness of breath, just flat out hypotension. And he gave steroids, and 10 minutes later was fine. And it turned out then, back he said, you know, I almost died was when I was in the service when they did a CT scan or something. And, but it, so I looked it up, and there is actually this idiosyncratic um, reaction that's pure hypotension with no classic allergic thing, so. One system. One system involved, cardiovascular. Yeah. yeah. All right, our last uh, talk for the session on pharmacology is contemporary lipid post uh, PCI, and Paul Coley's gonna talk that. Thank, yeah, you. thank you so much.
Um, I, I want to thank the program committee and Dr. Berlakis for inviting me. I feel very privileged as a non-invasive cardiologist to be here today to talk to you about lipid management in patients post-PCI. So you've just spent the last hour listening about the angry platelet. I'm going to talk to you about the angry lipids and what we can do as cardiologists to treat that. And you know, of course, when we're in the cath lab, we're treating one lesion at a time. We're putting one stent in at a time. When you're treating their lipids, you're treating populations at a time. So I really want you to take a step back and think about the impact of aggressive lipid management. And I'm going to show you some data that will surprise you that shows just how terrible a job we are doing with managing our patients post-PCI. And today, Two years into the COVID pandemic, as we stand here, we realize that survivors of COVID have an elevated vascular risk, as evidenced by new data released from the American Heart Association. So now more than ever, I hope that you will take up this initiative to be aggressive with your lipid management. Here are my disclosures. And I'm going to start by taking you to the bedside. So we're going to meet Arthur, who's a 68-year-old Hispanic male with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Then I'm going to talk to you about how to phenotype your ASCVD patients. The take-home point today is that not every ASCVD patient gets a target of 70. That is very traditional thinking, and we need to turn that on its head. Then we'll talk about the tools in our toolbox that we have for reducing LDL. I like to think of us as physicians, as artists. We're painters, and I'm going to give you all the paintbrushes that you need in your in toolbox today so that you can paint a palette for your patient. And then finally, we're going to talk about triglycerides and parallel risk pathways, because that is something else we're also under-treating in the modern era. So let's start by meeting Arthur. He's a 68-year-old Hispanic male with ASCVD. He had an NSTEMI, got his PCI, got two very beautiful drug-eluting stents to his LAD, but he still had a pretty significant infarct with his EF of only 35%. Now, he's our typical patient with a lot of comorbidities, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. He's pretty good in terms of his habits. He stops smoking after his MI, and he has no known allergies. Take a look at his medication list. He's on an RNE. I would argue that he also needs to be on an SGLT2 inhibitor, given the new guidelines that have just come out. But he's on a beta blocker. He's on an MRA. He's on insulin. Look at his lipid regimen. A torvastatin 20 milligrams is all he can take, and a zetamibe 10 milligrams has been added. His blood pressure is a little bit elevated above goal. He is overweight, as many of our patients often are. And if you look at his triglycerides, they're about 225 to 250. And his LDL, which was 103 months ago, today, during his infarct, was 95. So keep that in, in mind. When your patient presents with an ACS, what is their LDL on the day of the ACS? Now, we know that it can, of course, be artificially depressed because it's an acute phase reactant and can vary. But regardless, you want that delta LDL to be at least 50%. So looking at that baseline LDL really does help guide you in terms of prognosis and management. He also obviously has some kidney dysfunction with an estimated GFR of 53. His uric acid is a little bit elevated, and he has some micro albuminuria. So if you look at these, these are the DCRM consensus guidelines. DCRM is a conglomeration of multidisciplinary approach saying what do we need to do to treat risk. And you can see it goes lower and lower. So the first thing you need to do is to monitor, to check their LDL 6 to 12 weeks until that target is achieved. But how do you decide what that target is? Every ACS patient does not get a target of 70. So what you need to do is to phenotype your patient, to use risk modifiers to try to decide, is this a standard risk 70 target, or is this at higher risk, and we need to get them down to a target of 55 or perhaps even 40 if they've had two events within two years. At the bottom there, you see the tools in your toolbox that we currently have. The ones in green are the ones that are evidence-based with outcomes data, your statin, your PCSK9 inhibitor, and your azetamibe. The ones on the right-hand side are the newer tools, bempedoic acid, which drops your LDL 20%, and your bile acid sequestrants, which drops your LDL 20%. Neither of those have outcomes data. So remember, it's not just the LDL that you're getting to, it's the delta LDL as well. And you need to pick the one that's lower. So if they come in and have an MI with an LDL of 100, you cannot get them to 70, even if they're an average ACS risk patient, because you need that delta LDL to be at least 50%. 
Now let's go back to our patients. So these are the things that might be used as risk modifiers. And in him, you can see he had an ACS. He's older. He's got diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, and he has HEFREF. But you should also look at what type of kidney disease, not just the GFR, but also whether or not he has albuminuria, whether he has end organ damage. All of these are risk modifiers that previously we've only used to decide whether to start statin therapy, and now we actually use them to determine the targets for statin therapy. This is a data that's going to shock you from the Gould Registry, which is an outpatient registry that looks at patients, 5,000 patients with ASCVD. And less than one-third of them had LDL levels less than 70 at two years. Only 17% had lipid-lowering therapy intensification. 11% didn't even get their lipids checked. And only 21% had one lipid test. So we are failing. We are failing in what we're doing. And we treat the lesion with a stent, but unless we get on board with the LDL, they are going to come right back to the cath lab. And you can see here that actually in the same registry, their median LDL was 90 milligrams per deciliter. Only 49% of them, as shown on the right-hand side, were on a high-intensity statin, and only 10% of them were on a PCSK9 inhibitor. So phenotype those patients. Look at the delta LDL as well as the risk modifiers to determine where your target is and use all the tools in your toolbox. So these these are the tools that we have, right? We already know about statins and PCSK9 inhibitors and azetamibe, but today I'm going to tell you about ATP citrate lyase inhibitors, like Nexlatol, and I'm also going to tell you about an siRNA, which is called Lecvio, uh, which is a new medication that just got approved in January. So let's go uh, side by side on those. So alirucumab, which is a data that we've seen before from Odyssey Outcomes, was outpatient, uh, was, excuse me, ACS patients that were treated with a PCSK9 inhibitor. And you can see there was outcomes benefit occurring relatively early at one year. Same with evolucumab, which was stable CAD patients treated with a PCSK9 inhibitor. But what you don't know is that you're getting outcomes benefit, but you're also changing the plaque morphology. And that's the new data that I want to show you today. So, if, you know, you guys are interventionalists, so you know what the plaque looks like and what the key features are. But on the left-hand side, you'll see a thick fibrous core, you'll see lots of smooth muscle cells, and you'll see, uh, you know, a small lipid arc. On the other hand, on a vulnerable plaque, you see a large lipid core, a thin fibrous cap, and lots and lots of inflammation, as evidenced by macrophages. So we can use OCT to help us decide whether this is you know, a stable plaque or this is an angry plaque. And we know that an, a fibrous cap thickness of less than 65 micrometers suggests a thin fibrous cap, whereas a, a wide lipid arc with greater than 90 degrees of lipid suggests an angry plaque. So looking at OCT endpoints, we know from red industry data that low LDLs leads to narrower lipid arcs and thicker fibrous caps. So you're not just treating the number, you are changing the morphology of that plaque and making it more stable by reducing their LDL. In fact, in a randomized trial done recently um, with evolucumab in patients with NSTEMI who were randomized to evolucumab versus placebo and then followed with OCT and IVIS endpoints, you can see that they had a substantial change. So evolucumab, in addition to statins, doubled the absolute change in minimum fibrous cap thickness and reduced the maximum lipid arc. Let me stop there for a second. This is a paradigm shift in how we're thinking about LDL lowering. LDL lowering doesn't happen in the office, doesn't happen later. It needs to happen the day that they present with their ACS, because you want to start to modify that angry plaque, try to make that fibrous cap thicker, and try to really change that plaque phenotype early. And in fact, what you'll see is that there's a dose-dependent relationship. So on the right-hand side, you see here that the lower you get your LDL, the thicker you get that fibrous cap thickness. So this is a mechanistic explanation for why LDL lowering is helping people stay out of the cath lab. And we saw the same thing with alirucumab if we look at IVIS. And on the right-hand side, you'll see that there was actually a change in the plaque volume. So now I've told you you have less plaque, you have less lipid arc, and you have a thicker fibrous cap thickness. Um, so very similar results regardless of which PCSK9 inhibitor you're using. And again, this was evolution leukomab looking at plaque volume, and you can see that dose-dependent relationship now with the plaque volume. The lower you get that LDL, the more you decrease the amount of plaque you have. Okay, so how do we get that LDL low? 
Well, should we start giving combination lipid therapy up front? Yes. We no longer do serial escalation with your statin and then you wait and then your, your zetamibe and then you wait. You need to hit them early and hit them hard with combination therapy. And this was e the EVAX trial where you took NSTEMI patients who came in and, and gave them one single dose, one injection that occurred right after they went for their PCI in the hospital of evolucumab 420 milligrams. And look at that orange line. Within four days, you got that LDL down 65%, and it stayed down, of course, and you can compare that to the ones that got placebo. So we need to start thinking about the angry plaque just as much as we're thinking about that angry platelet and really using this combination therapy to get people to their goal, start to change their plaque morphology. Now I'm going to show you a couple more things in your toolbox here. The ATP citrate lyase inhibitors, bempedoic acid is, is the one on the market that is it works in the same pathway as statin. So if you look at statins on the left-hand side inhibiting HMG-CoA reductase, this is two steps upstream. So same pathway as statins, meaning all the downstream effects are the same. The difference, it's a prodrug. So it doesn't actually get activated in the muscle and doesn't give you a lot of the myalgias that you get with statins. So that's really helpful. It can raise your uric acid and your creatinine a little bit because there is some activity on the O2 receptor in the nephron in the kidney. Now this has been studied in randomized clinical trials as well. It doesn't have outcomes data, but that clear outcomes trial is cooking and should report sometime next year. But if you look at the two blue studies that was on a background of maximally tolerated statins and the two orange studies are for our statin intolerant patients that have ASCVD. Now you're not hitting it out of the ballpark with bempedoic acid. I like to say if your bases are loaded and you need to bring your man home, this is what you reach for. Because you look at that LDL reduction on top of statins in the blue on the left hand side, 15 to 17 percent. It's not hitting it out of the ballpark, but a really nice way to get them to that goal with an oral therapy. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see if they're not on a statin, you actually get a little more bang for your buck with an LDL reduction around 25%. What I like to do is something I call a Zetia switch, because there's a combination therapy of bempedoic acid and azetamibe. So you stop the azetamibe and you start the combo pill. That way their pill burden stays the same, but you have reduced their LDL. I'm going to skip the monitoring for the sake of time, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the small interfering RNA for PCSK9, which is Lecvio or Inclycerin. So the mechanism of action is important here, so I want you guys to pay attention. So basically, inclycerin is an siRNA that is, has a little moiety on it. So if you look in the top left-hand corner at that little hexagon, that's, it, that tags it to go to hepatocytes only, and it doesn't go anywhere else. The hepatocytes pick it up, they put it in the cytoplasm, and then instead of stopping the protein, which is what a PCSK9 antibody does, it binds up the protein, it actually stops the translation so you stop the messenger RNA from getting translated into the protein by silencing the messenger RNA. So you give one injection of the drug, it gets in your liver, and it works for six months. So this is a twice yearly injection to lower your LDL. So I'm thinking of my non-compliant patients, I'm thinking of my patients with limited access. You give them uh, two loading doses up front at zero and three months, but then after that it's once every six months. But it's not circulating anymore. So once it gets into your liver, it's not actually in the bloodstream, it hasn't changed your DNA, it's not still detectable, there's no concern about reversal or pregnancy or anything else, it's just doing its thing basically stopping PCSK9 expression, but doing it at the level of translation rather than at the protein level. So you see that from the Orion trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine 10 and 11, you get a 50% reduction in LDL. Now you can imagine you can't use this alongside a PCSK9 inhibitor because your, your endpoint, your target is the same, which is PCSK9, but you can of course use it on top of bempedoic acid, on top of statins as well. Now the final thing I'll leave you guys with is the triglycerides. Let's not forget get that parallel risk reduction pathway. I often have people ask me, should you do LDL first or triglycerides, and my answer is both. So just because you're working on LDL doesn't mean you ignore those triglycerides. You really have to think about them as well in a parallel fashion. We know that the only drug to date, out of all the things in our toolbox shown there on the bottom, that, that has outcomes benefit are our statins and our vasipa. Fibrates and omega-3s that are combination and others will treat the number, they will not treat the risk.
So they get those triglycerides down, but they do not improve cardiovascular outcomes. So you need to be switching your patients from fibrates or from other such Lavaza medications to Vasipa, which reduces risk as well. So to remind you of the Reduce it trial, you guys remember a number needed to treat very impressive of 21 to 28, depending on the cardiovascular endpoint. And this was independent of on-treatment triglycerides. So triglycerides are different from LDL. We don't just get them down. It really doesn't matter where you end up at with your on-treatment triglycerides. Your risk reduction is the same. It's identical once you take Vasipa. So very interesting, more of a marker of risk rather than potentially actually participating in the risk. So I come back to Arthur, bring you back to his bedside and say, okay, he's not just a regular target of 70. He's got diabetes, he's got stage three kidney disease, and he's got other risk modifiers that puts him at extreme risk. So I'm actually setting him for a target of 55, or perhaps even lower, 50, because he needs that delta LDL of 50%. So I'm going to start him on a PCSK9 inhibitor. Of all the tools that I presented in my toolbox, that would be my first reach. But you could think about in glycerin, it doesn't have outcomes data as PCSK9 does. And then I'm also going to start him on icosapentethyl because his triglycerides were elevated. So I want to remind us that there's a dose-dependent relationship between LDL and MACE. So lowering lipids is an emergency. There is an urgency to treat that in the cath lab just as much as there is an urgency to treat that platelet. We're not doing a good job. We have been under-treating our patients, and as a result, they keep coming back with recurrent events, particularly in that first year, so we really have to step up our efforts. We need to change the paradigm of lipid lowering, just like we've done for hypertension and other such things. Instead of monotherapy with serial escalation, we do combination therapy up front and hit that hard, and you want to treat aggressively and treat early. So uh, with that, I'm open to any questions, and thank you so much for your attention. So that was outstanding. And in, uh, just one comment, I, Frank. Um, number one, uh, when you have STEMI programs, a, st a critically important part of your STEMI program is not pretreatment, during the PCI, but post-treatment. And, and it's critical to having good outcomes in your STEMI system, for sure. And I think uh, too often, it's, uh, you're 100% correct. So another, th another comment about there's actually, uh, both in Europe and the United States, there's now an outcome trial using a PCSK9 inhibitor in the hospital for acute MI patients. So we'll see that soon. Comments from the panel? So, you know, I, I, I'm fairly aggressive with lipid lowering therapy, but I'm very frustrated because insurance companies would rather pay for stents than get Nexeltal approved. Uh, I've had two patients, you know, on Blackvio, but uh, it's very difficult. They, they want you to jump through a staged approach, which we know is delays uh, on target LDL goals. So, you know, any advice here about dealing with that. We, and we have PharmDs, we do the prior auths, but it can be months before we get approval of PCSK9s or Nexeltal. Thank you for making that point, because there's this disconnect between the theory and the reality of medicine. So I would say a couple things. The first is, if, if you have PCSK9 inhibitors in your hospital formulary, starting inpatient, as we saw with the EVAC study, doesn't just get them to goal. It actually also helps coverage issues, because then it's already been initiated in the hospital. Second, I would say there are insurance companies such as United Healthcare, which will ask you how far you are from your goal. So it's very important to define that goal in your notes, because if you say, I'm greater than 20% away from my goal, they will let you take a shortcut and skip azetamibe and go directly to combo therapy such as Nexlazet, which is azetamibe plus bempedoic acid or to a PCSK9 inhibitor. I have, I have a comment. So I, I like how you, you set the goals, but I think it's overly complicated uh, for somebody who has 20 minutes. I mean, you know, the bean counter is uh, counting the minutes also that we spend with patients. So it's very hard to establish those goals. So once Bravo came to our hospital and said, well, the, you know, LDL is like smoking. You don't ask a patient to just smoke less. You just go and tell them not to smoke. So LDL is about the same. So you, so you have to suppress the LDL as much as you can to achieve the best outcomes. You know, that comes to the questions of what do you do about those patients with an LDL of less than 10, LDL of less than 20. So then the thing is that you get frustrated because you get those levels and then they go to the community, they see the primary doctor, and then the primary doctor says, no, that's too much uh, lipitor. So we're going to reduce lipitor to 40. 
Yeah, it happens a lot. Thank you for making that point. So, so I would say a couple things. First, if you're on a PCSK9 inhibitor, be very mindful of when you're sending them for that LDL. Because if you send them at week one after their injection and they're on every four week injection, you're gonna get the nadir and that's not actually their LDL. So sometimes I, I make it a point to tell my patient, go the day before your next PCSK9 injection is due because that's gonna be the peak. Now the truth actually is somewhere in the middle because you get a nadir and you get a peak, but really it's important to sort of see what their worst LDL is. So that's the first point. The second point is de-escalation for very low LDLs. Now we're getting a lot of data with very low LDLs with LECVIO, with PCSK9 inhibitors that have shown that there are no significant neurocognitive events. Basically from Ebbinghaus, which was a sub-study of the Fourier trial, we saw no neurocognitive events occurring with LDLs less than 30. My grain of salt with that is that it was a two-year follow-up and we know that neurocognitive events can sometimes take longer. But at this point, if their risk is high, I I drive their LDL down for a specific reason. Now, I don't just drive it down for the sake of getting it as low as possible if their risk is not particularly elevated. But I do want to make the point that the risk assessment should be iterative, despite the challenges that we have with time, because at every visit, their risk will change. If they've had an event in the middle, if something has happened, if they've developed renal dysfunction, if they develop mm -hmm. diabetes. So I, I spend the last three minutes of every visit as a preventive cardiologist on LDL even if it's a visit for palpitations or AFib or something else, and I try to make it part of my every visit. Yeah, great uh, points. Uh, we have one more uh, question from the... LDL is 130, uh, thank you. And even if you do coronary artery calcium score to break the tie, it's gonna be negative. I mean, they're so young to have a calcium deposition. What do you do with those population? I personally treat them. I mean, I don't know is it right or wrong. I mean, can we do a trial that big and that low risk group or not? But I personally treat, so what uh, do you do? Young patients with elevated LDL, even if it's moderately elevated, 100% of the time I'm treating them. Now, of course, I have a discussion with my male patients who are young about spermatogenesis with lower LDLs and being on statin therapy with my female patients about pregnancy, but we know it's the area under the curve. It's, yeah. it's even a mild or moderate LDL elevation in your 30s and 40s is going to re lead to vascular risk and, and atherosclerosis in your 50s and 60s. Well, well, stay tuned for the next uh, cholesterol treatment guidelines and see what happened there. Uh, a couple of times uh, we, we heard in this talk that we're, doing a, we're not doing a good job. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to close with, a, um, I think, a, a, a good uh, um, a message. The interventional cardiologist is doing a great job. A lot of the studies that we saw that are positive, they only came about the last one or two years as I saw the slides. There were 20, 21, and 22 publications. So what happened here is that this, uh, all these drugs were out of reach in some kind of a different world of the sponsors or whoever was in charge of the earlier trials. They were lost in the primary prevention, chronic patients. That's why you have all these problems with nobody knows exactly when to start them, nobody approves them, because for, I don't know, many years, they were not in the area of what you just said. IQTMI started away, hospital started away. In fact, they were left outside the hospital on purpose because they were going over the masses, except that the masses, you have to start from somewhere, and that's where the problem was, and lasted five years plus pandemic, seven to eight years. So in general, we are doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you all Thank for you. the attention and coming up for this great uh, session. Thank you.